Standing wave ratio can be very important when using a transmitter. If the level of standing waves is too high, then it can either damage the transmitter or transceiver output, or cause it to reduce its power. So measuring the SWR is important. In this video, we'll look at how to connect up an SWR bridge or meter, how to use it, and then we'll give some key hints and tips on using them. SWR bridges, or SWR meters, come in many forms. They don't have to cost too much, although higher price ones do give better performance and they can measure more parameters like power levels. When the SWR meter arrives and you open the box to get it out of its packing, it'll typically come with a few simple instructions providing the basics of its operation. The instrument is relatively straightforward. On the front, it'll have an analogue meter calibrated with the SWR readings. It'll have a control knob and a switch. And then on the back, there'll be two connections, one for the antenna and one for the transmitter as we see here. Connecting up the SWR meter is really easy. For convenience, and for monitoring the SWR that the transmitter itself sees, it's normal to connect it in at the transmitter end of the feeder as we see here. So connect the antenna lead to the socket marked ant or antenna on the SWR meter, and the socket marked transmitter or TX goes to the rig. To measure the SWR, it's necessary to have a steady signal, so select AM, FM or Morse on the transmitter. We'll use Morse and put the key down to transmit a signal. Also set the transmitter to a low power position so that if the SWR is high then it won't damage the transmitter output and also we won't cause too much interference. Next, choose a clear channel. It's best to listen for a while to make sure nobody is using it. Then set the forward reverse switch on the meter to forward, key the transmitter and adjust the CAL control for full scale. Then switch the meter to reverse and read off the SWR. It's as simple as that. It's worth taking a quick look at the scales on SWR meters. In the meter we used in the demonstration, the top scale is for SWR. It's calibrated as a number. At the left it's 1 and this corresponds to an SWR of 1 to 1 and this indicates a perfect match. On the right it's infinity to 1, although in this case there's no actual marking. It's also worth noting that above 3 to 1 the scale is marked in red as a warning that the SWR is high. Below this scale is one marked as percentage reflected power. It can be seen that when a quarter of the power is reflected, this corresponds to an SWR of 3 to 1. Then the bottom scale is just an arbitrary scale, showing the portion of full scale deflection going from 1 to 10. Multiply this by 10 to get the percentage. This is just one example of an SWR meter, and others will be a little different, but they have basically the same concepts. This one here has the SWR scale at the bottom, and again, 1 to 1 is on the left. Above this are some power scales, as this meter can also be used to measure power. There are three ranges, so the best scale can be chosen with a front panel switch for the power levels in use. If there is an antenna tuning unit in the system, the SWR meter is normally placed between the transmitter or transceiver and the ATU. In this way, it's possible to monitor the SWR that the transmitter is seeing and having to cope with. The best place to see the SWR from the antenna match is actually at the antenna itself. Unfortunately, this isn't normally convenient because most antennas are either outside or generally inaccessible. But this is not necessarily bad because it's possible to monitor the SWR that the transmitter is seeing and in this way make sure it's acceptable for the transmitter operation. We need to remember that the feeder loss can have a major impact on the SWR readings that are seen at the transmitter. Here we have the example of a transmitter with an output of 100 watts into a feeder. This feeder has a 3 dB loss to give us some convenient figures and it's also not totally unreasonable. This means that only 50 watts arrives at the antenna. If 60% of the power is reflected, this results in 30 watts coming back along the feeder and it corresponds to an SWR of 8 to 1 at this point, which is not good. The reflected power travels back and it undergoes a further 3 dBs of attenuation from the feeder and it becomes just 15 watts. For sending out 100 watts, 15 watts of reflected power appears at the transmitter and this corresponds to an SWR of 2.2 to 1. 
The moral of this story is that a good SWR may not necessarily mean that the antenna is right. Make sure that the feeder loss is as low as possible, and then not only will the most signal reach the antenna and be radiated, but you'll have a much better idea of what's going on. And now for a few other useful tips. Make sure that the meter is connected around the right way. It's actually quite easy to get the connections wrong amongst all the other wiring around, and this will mean that the forward and reverse switch positions are reversed. Make sure the meter is meant to operate on the frequencies you want. Some meters can only operate over a certain frequency range. Operate outside its range and the results won't be as good. Sensitivity, for example, may not be sufficient. Some SWR meters even have several sensors within the single unit, like this one, to overcome these problems. When checking an antenna, it's best to check it over the whole range of frequencies you want, as the SWR can change even over a relatively small band. So there it is. SWR meters are easy to set up and use, but there are a few points to be aware of when using them. Thank you.